Hi, I'm Dr. Francis Yahia, and today I want to talk to you about the importance of mythology in learning and studying astrology, and I want to talk about one particular myth of Pluto, Demeter, and Persephone. So in order to really know astrology deeply and understand these archetypes in your psyche and what's happening in your life, you must know mythology. If you need a primer on my YouTube, there's a basics of who's who in mythology, as well as the archetypes. I'll be teaching a learn your archetypes in a few weeks, so you can reach out to me if you're interested. So you need to find a pantheon that you reflect with or connect with. I use Greek mythology. You can use Hindu, you can use Nordic, you can use um, any philosophy, Sumerian mythology. They all have the same characters. These are archetypes. There are 12 main archetypes that are repeated in any story, in any fairy tale, in your life, and of course, in any pantheon of mythology. So I will be using the Greek Roman pantheon when I teach. Sometimes I'll interrelate with some Hindu or with some um, different mythologies, but for the most part, I teach using Greek mythology. So once you get very acclimated to just the basic myths, you're going to start understanding the relationship of the planets in your chart and with transits especially. So hard aspects like squares and oppositions are going to be where the two gods are not getting along. If there's trines and sextiles, the gods are getting along. So you don't have to worry so much about those relationships. You also want to know in mythology, did the gods get along? So for instance, here's Uranus, who was the grandfather to Jupiter. In this particular person's chart, they're almost trying. They're in the same element. So they're not causing a conflict. But if in the story, Uranus and Jupiter are friends, and in the person's chart, they're squared in opposition, you're going to find that same storyline having a problem in their psyche. So this is how we start to layer the chart, not only by aspect, by transits, by house, by element, and we start to build the story that the client is living out in their mind, rooted in these different archetypes. So mythology is the basis of astrology. Without a pantheon, you'll just be doing what I call sticky note spirituality or fluffy sort of basic astrology, knowing a planet in a location, but not much. If you really want to know yourself, and astrology is the number one tool for self-awareness, you really want to know yourselves. The patterns in your psyche, this is you on a piece of paper. These voices that I call the collaborative or competitive voices is how the planets that I call the psychological organs speak to one another. So you may not know what your liver and pancreas does, and you may not know what your Saturn and Uranus does, but your psyche is set up and it's going to play it out. The transits are going to come and wake up those dormant aspects. It's kind of like if you have a heart attack or a stroke, same thing, a planet will aspect or wake up an aspect in your chart with the transit. And all of a sudden you're going to know Pluto or Uranus or Saturn, just like you're all of a sudden going to know what type of food to eat or not. If you have a pancreas or a liver issue, same concepts. So I want to talk about one of the most important myths, which is the myth of Pluto, Persephone and Demeter. So we're just going to look at it with the Pluto in the moon. So you're going to start looking at the relationships between these planets, so you can see how you play out this myth. Wherever you have Pluto, whatever house and by sign, but specifically what house, you are going to live out the Demeter, Pluto, Persephone mythology. So the myth is that Demeter, whose mother earth, we're just gonna represent her by the moon today, keeps her daughter Persephone drugged she gives her a narcissus flower to, to, to say sort of drugged and innocent. That is what happens to us. We have what I call a snow globe. Our snow globe is cracked, but we try to live with an intact psyche, an intact innocent story. Well, we cannot live in the world. We will be eaten, devoured alive if we live an innocence archetype. The innocence archetype, just so you know, is the Neptune. So Joseph Campbell used to talk about the one forbidden thing. This was repeated in mythology 
You can do all things, but that one door like in Blackbeard or that one apple in the Garden of Eden. We all have that in our psyche. So our parents unknowingly keep us very innocent in this one section of life. That's going to talk about the house that your Pluto is in. Pluto's rule or role in the story, he abducted or raped Persephone. When he abducts Persephone, he rips the earth open. I'll explain the significance in a moment. And he takes her into the underworld. In the underworld that he rules, there is a rule. If you eat anything, you are a willing guest and a willing participant. Persephone ate six pomegranate seeds. So Zeus came down to the underworld to visit Pluto and to negotiate because Demeter or Mother Earth was very sad. There was no fruit, there were no flowers, the birds had started, stopped chirping and people were dying. And he said to Pluto, can you please give back Persephone? And he's like, well, she was a willing participant to come down here, six pomegranate seeds. How about six months out of the year, she lives with me and six months she lives with her mother. So this is my concept of the 48 to 52. Part of your structure, part of your day, part of your life is in sort of maybe a child innocence, um, delusional imagination, if you don't want to sort of rip all veils, but part of your life dedicated to your spiritual life, your spiritual riches that Pluto does rule. He rules not only material riches, but also spiritual riches should be dedicated to shadow work, going into the underworld, looking at why you created things. It's important to note in the myth, she's a willing and active participant in this assault or this rape. Prior to your conception in your psyche, when this chart and your psyche was sort of being percolated in your parents' conception and, and, and pregnancy and so forth, you chose the location of your Pluto. Your soul, maybe not your body or your mind consciously, was an active participant in that this would be the assault the world would have on you. In this particular person's case, it's in the seventh house. She had to rearrange her definition of marriage because she is gay and she struggled with that, that she was not going to be able to have a healthy relationship because she had this particular issue that she deemed as unworthy. Not that it's true, but that's how she saw it in her psyche. So it was through her relationships, not marriage, but, but long-term loving relationships with partners that she actually understood that her assault from the world, her veils removed from what mom and dad had taught her from her intact delusional snow globe was relationships were going to be a learning, a place with a lot of learning lessons. So this is where we actively decide and choose to get soul lessons. We ask Pluto or Hades to come into our life to take this from us. So the deal is that Persephone goes to mom six months out of the year and is in the underworld six months out of the year. Anytime you have a Pluto transit that activates any planet, but especially the moon, if you have that transit in a lifetime, because not everybody will have that transit. Um, it could be a square moon, a opposition moon, or a conjunct moon. You're going to live out this myth, but you're going to live out this myth regardless with the relationship between your Pluto and your moon. So what you want to start doing is what I call process wins and outcome wins. What are earthly wins that you can give to sort of Demeter? And what are process wins or spiritual wins that you can give to Pluto? If you can find a house where you have Pluto and decide a 50-50, so to speak, where you can give that section of your life, both spiritual and material attention, Pluto transits are going to be a little softer. And that's with a wink because they're never soft. But with some cognizance, we can maybe try to live them at a bit of a higher vibration. So that's how you identify where Pluto is going to literally be the perpetrator in the chart. But you have asked at the soul level for this lesson. So this archetype is of the perpetrator. This archetype is of the underworld. This archetype 
is of something that assaults or rapes you metaphorically. Unfortunately, some people do have literal rapes and that is not minimizing that at all. But to our psyche, Pluto is the perpetrator and the one who assaults us so that we can get out of the veiled, sort of drugged, drugged innocent state that we are all in. Despite our childhood, there is something that we try in our psyche because of the sun and the moon in our charts to try to keep our parents on a pedestal. It does not matter even if you have what I call an extremely shattered snow globe, you might live that out as uber innocent or you're an extreme sort of evil or devil that you see yourself as. Neither zero to 100 is accurate. The truth is somewhat in the middle, what I call the 48 to 52. So this particular person is a Virgo, Pluto, six degrees, and here's her moon at 27. It's not an exact square, but it is about, oh yeah, it's nine degrees. So here's six, three degrees over, she's already in Sagittarius. So zero degrees of Sag pretty much to six degrees of Virgo. And she absolutely has a square to her Pluto moon. The worst assaults are going to be Pluto moon that are squares, conjuncts are horrible and oppositions. You're really going to live out the myth of Demeter and Persephone in some way. What I recommend doing is drawing a triangle, doing victim, uh, martyr, savior, and perpetrator. Pluto's the perpetrator. And if you, the way I lived it out, I was the victim in the sense that my children were taken from me, according to the myth, not that I didn't create it, in my, in my triangle. So the children were abducted or raped or, or taken, and I was Demeter in this story. And so my ex-husband was Pluto. But you're always all three. This is all happening in your mind. I'm, I'm not a victim of this, but that's the way I lived it out. So if you can identify on your triangle the victim, the savior, and the perpetrator, and if you put yourself in the role of perpetrator, this is in your psyche where you call the shots, where you unveil yourself, where you identify your shadow, then you won't live out, <coughs> excuse me, that victim, savior, victim, martyr, rescue um, uh, sort of alliance so poorly the way I did. So this person is absolutely going to live out some way this myth. We're all going to live it out in our house. But if the trine or the, the, the moon happens to be square, conjunct or opposition, you're going to live it out really marked in those houses. So in my particular case, I have Pluto in the 10th and my mom gave me over 10th house Pluto. My mother gave me over to the cult leader's nephew and I was abducted and um, an active participant, but abducted by the Pluto that then when I redid the triangle, my mom moved and my children um, and my mom replaced each other on the triangle. So if you draw that triangle, you'll constantly see who the players are. The more you can show up as the perpetrator because it's your psyche, I'm not talking about your earthly story, meaning that you unveil, you bring yourself to the shadow, you bring yourself to the underworld, you look at yourself as a mirror, the less the victim rescuer, the victim savior has to play out. In this case, Demeter acted like a savior to save her daughter, Persephone, who was the victim. So here's the moon and there's a square. This is going to take place, I mean, in this person's seventh house and the ninth or the 10th, if you want to move it over just a few degrees. When planets are touching, like in this case, any cusp, but especially one of the main cusps, the one, four, seven, 10, that's like if the energy is in both of those houses. So this is being lived out in the ninth. And this person did move from another country. So she was not only sort of raped by the world when she had to move at a very young age, her country, ninth house, but also by her mother who didn't accept her sexuality. So therefore the mother played the victim. She was the perpetrator because she got involved um, what her mother would not agree with. And then perhaps the, the lover or the partner who she had to literally keep in the closet was now the victim. So you're seeing that all three are always in play. The best, and that sounds kind of weird, 
the best role is to have the Pluto role, the perpetrator role, what I call the tip of the triangle, and let the victim savior, victim martyr, victim rescuer be at the bottom. Because if you are the perpetrator in your psyche, you're calling the shots, you're bringing yourself to the underworld, you're not taken by surprise by some violation or assault. You're looking at your shadow, and that's part of that. You're really honoring your shadow work and your spiritual riches, which is what Pluto wants. So this myth is very, very marked. If you're lucky enough to not have many Pluto transits, that's phenomenal. I unfortunately had a severe Pluto transit. So let's look at this person. And look, they have a Pluto transit entering their 12th house. So the 12th house Pluto is the worst Pluto. It's an existential crisis. It's literally going to the bottom of the ocean. So your deepest, darkest sort of secrets are going to be revealed. And in this person's case, because it comes from the seventh, they're going to be revealed via relationship. So perhaps at this point, she comes out of the closet or she admits to family, friends, or to the earthly world. This is sort of the front door of your home, if you will, like the part that people socially see you. It's ruled by Libra, it's the seventh house. And she finally owns that full part of herself so that she's no longer sort of the victim of the story. So the Pluto transits are going to always refer back to where you have the Pluto in, in your chart. You can also, of course, look at the relationship to the moon. At this point, she's at 26 degrees Scorp uh, Capricorn. It's going to be just next year. It's going to be in Aquarius. And then that's really when it's going to affect, affect her because now it's going to be square, albeit not yet. Um, it's going to start squaring this entire stellium here in Scorpio. So then she's really going to be hit. When you have Pluto transits, they're extremely hard. You are going to visit the underworld. You're going to feel as if somebody perpetrated you, raped you, assaulted you, and dragged you down there. I said that Pluto opened the earth and grabbed Persephone from her mother Demeter. There's a significance in that half. Wherever you have Pluto in your chart, half is the world word. If, if you're as old as I am, you remember uh, Eddie Murphy had a funny com uh, comedy show called Raw, and he was making fun of how women would take half from their husbands. This is Pluto. Wherever you have Pluto, you are required to give half. If it's half of the relationship, half the time, half the money, that is where Pluto is cashing in his chips and saying half of your life in this section needs to end abruptly. It's where you have endings with no closure. Don't try to see closure in those relationships. And you have to see your role in being the perpetrator, even if on the surface to the earthly consciousness, it appears that you're the victim or the savior. Inevitably, where Pluto is, you are perpetrating, even though you might wear the sheaf, uh, the sheep and wolf's clothing mask. So all Pluto transits are going to bring you back to the house to relive a version of the Persephone Pluto Demeter mythology. Now I like to tell clients the same exact participants the first time around with that Pluto, no matter what your Pluto transit was or the way you lived out the Pluto moon relationship or just the Pluto if you happen to have a trine or a sextile in that house will revisit you over and over and over again. The story does not change. So I'll give you an example. I have a client who has a Pluto moon conjunction in her sixth. When her mother, she was just about a year old, her mother, or a month old, I'm sorry, had postpartum depression, left her and, uh, and, and went off and a cop found the baby and then brought her back home. That client is going to relive that version of a story over and over and over again. Mom or a mom surrogate, a park and a policeman, and perhaps some sort of mental health issues. This seems a little unfair, but this is what's programmed in your psyche. However, 
The one thing that the chart can never tell you is the level of consciousness in which you are going to appear. So if the root story, <coughs> excuse me, in this client's case is mom had postpartum depression, left her in a park and a cop brought her back home, those characters are going to remain in the story. But your level of consciousness will choose how it's going to play out. So in this particular person's case, I give her the example that when she moves to a new house, let's say, or she goes off to college, she can be escorted by the security guard on campus to her dorm, even though she's sad, the depression version of moving out of her parents' house. So we get to choose level of consciousness. Every planet has four levels of consciousness, two low level and two high level. We choose. Nobody can choose your free will and the level of consciousness and say you're going to choose it out. So the more you know mythology, the more you know the stories, the more you know the levels of vibration, each of the four levels for each of the planets, the more you can plan so that these transits don't destroy you, but rather you can work with them so that they enhance your life. You learn the lesson. You're not a victim. You're not a savior. You're the perpetrator of your own psyche, which is the whole purpose of life, which is to raise vibration. Thank you very much.